Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, hope everyone's Earth Week is off to a good start. Uh, I'm Dan Brissett, the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, of course, every day at EESI is Earth Week and every day is Earth, Way, Earth Day, but we still found new ways to commemorate the 50th anniversary, including an interview with activist and author Byron Kennard, who is one of the key organizers for the Earth Day, for the first Earth Day, web articles about our work to encourage on-bill financing and beneficial electrification in Washington state, and reflections on climate solutions in the time of coronavirus, and an all-new video message thanks to two of our fellows, Tom Beach and Jeff Overton. All of this is available to our newsletter subscribers and anyone who takes a moment to visit us online at www.esi.org. Happy Earth Week. Thanks for joining us today for a virtual briefing about coastal resilience in Alaska. Even though we're not meeting today in person, I'd like to take a moment to thank the office of Senator Lisa Murkowski for their support leading up to today, and also to thank Senator Murkowski for her leadership and support for a wide range of bipartisan energy policies as chairwoman of the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee. If you're joining us today for the first time, this briefing is part of a series that looks at regional approaches to coastal resilience. In 2019, we brought together panels of experts, practitioners, and community leaders from the Gulf Coast, Northeast, and New England, Louisiana and the West Coast. And earlier this year, we convened experts who discussed efforts around the Great Lakes and the Southeast States and Hawaii. Last week, for the first time, we held a mini series of five briefings for Climate Adaptation Data Week. If you've missed any of our briefings on coastal resilience or any other climate and clean energy policy topic for that matter, you can access briefing summaries and video recordings at www.esi.org. And when you visit us online, please take a moment to sign up for our Climate Change Solutions newsletter to learn about other resilience initiatives, clean energy legislation, and to stay informed about all manner of ESI goings on, including our briefing schedule. Most of us are likely in our second month of teleworking and practicing social distancing to help get the coronavirus outbreak under control. And just as every day is Earth Day at ESI, we're doing our best to remain focused on the threats of climate change. So today's briefing is just one way we continue to bring you opportunities to hear from climate, clean energy, and resilience experts via webinar. Climate change might not feel as urgent, relatively speaking, right now, but it is. And our briefing today will cover coastal resilience in Alaska. Every region is special and different, both in terms of challenges and innovations, but Alaska is extra special and extra different. It has a colder, even Arctic climate, more shoreline than the rest of the other states combined, a massive string of Aleutian Islands, active volcanoes, and just a huge amount of land area. And then there are the people, diverse, of proud heritage, and of a lot hardier stock than me to tough it out up there. I'm looking forward to hearing from our panelists, joining us remotely today from the last frontier about their work to protect and improve the resilience of Alaskan coastal communities. One last thing before we turn to our panelists. Because we're not in the same room today, I cannot call on you if you have a question. So please follow EESI on Twitter at EESI online and send in your questions that way. You can also send an email to eesi at eesi.org. But Twitter sounds a lot more fun to me, so I encourage everyone to do that. And when you submit your questions, we'll draw from your submissions after we hear from our panelists, so all questions will be saved till the end. Now let's turn to our panel. Our first pan panelist is Jeremy Little. Jeremy is a research ecologist with the Department of Interior Alaska Climate Science Center. He conducts research on the role of climate and ecological drought in Alaskan and other forested ecosystems. He also facilitates the use of climate information and planning, adaptation, and vulnerability assessment. And Jeremy, I just want to make sure I pronounced your last name correctly. It's Little or Littell? Sorry about that. It's Littell. Okay, sorry about that. I had it written and um, the T's and the L's combined. So um, sorry about that. But turn it over to you. Really, thanks for being with us today, and I'm looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Jeremy Littell. I'm a climate impacts ecologist at the U.S. Geological Survey and the lead scientist at the Alaska Climate Adaptation Science Center. I grew up in Alaska and I live here now, and I thank you for your attention today as we discuss coastal resilience in Alaska. I also want to thank EESI for organizing this briefing and for providing a forum for discussing these important topics. And I want to thank my co-presenters for all I've learned from them in preparing for this briefing. I'm going to start our discussion today by talking about current and projected threats to coastal resilience in Alaska. Next slide. 
But first, I want to take a minute of my time and ask you to try, even if you've never been to one, to imagine a coastal Alaskan community. There are about 6,600 miles of Alaskan coastline and over 100 communities you might choose from. It might be a watershed along, in a watershed along the southeast Alaskan coast among temperate rainforest trees with glaciated valleys above, a rocky intertidal coastline, and abundant salmon in the ocean offshore. It might instead be a village along a slough near the mouth of the Yukon River where the few trees around the wet tundra resemble tall shrubs and the horizon line is hard to see because there's essentially no vis visible topography. Or it might be a village on a barrier island facing the Chukchi Sea where livelihoods are based on access to seasonal sea ice. Whatever community you imagine, chances are you can get there only by plane or boat. It's also likely that local fish and wildlife provide a significant fraction of the food needed by the community. And it's likely that the infrastructure, food security, and ultimately the resilience of that community are threatened by impacts to coastal resilience. Next, please. Being resilient means understanding and preparing for threats or stressors. The current threats to coastal community resilience in Alaska are diverse because the communities, their physical and ecological environments, the types and design of infrastructure, and the reliance on traditional and subsistence foods are diverse. One thing they all have in common is a long history of adaptation to variation in the environment, indigenous knowledge, and a commitment to, a commitment to maintaining those as an uncertain future unfolds. They're also faced with hazards driven in part by climate change. My task in this presentation is to convey to you the nature of current trends in and projections for some of the main threats to coastal community resilience. If I leave you with nothing else, scientific advances are steps toward better prediction and adaptation to a future that does not much resemble the past we've, we have experience with. But the rate of change is fast enough that steps are not by themselves enough. We need big strides, and that comes from coordinating the science, integrating it for prediction, and combining it with indigenous knowledge. In short, working with communities to make what they need with their input, local information for planning and adaptation. Next slide, please. From media and agency reports, you're likely familiar with coastal flooding and erosion threats in some Alaska coastal communities. Kivalina, pictured here, is a community that figures prominently in such re reports as far back as at least 2003, when the GAO highlighted risks to Kivalina and other communities. On the left is before and on the right after a barrier to minimize erosion was constructed on the windward side of the community. From these photos, you can see clearly that the, uh, the community is exposed to coastal erosion on its windward side, and there's a lagoon uh, on, the, on what's your right, um, to the shore or leeward side of the, of the community. It's in a pretty precarious position. Next. In these images of Shishmareft on the left from August 2012 on top, August 2017 in the middle photo, and November of 2017 in the small bottom photo, erosion can be seen. Note the difference between August of 2017 in the middle and November of 2017, primarily the result of a single storm. You can see the black arrow on the right of each photo is pointing to the same place on that piece of land near Shishmaref, and you can see the, the relatively large area that has been eroded in front of, in the beginning, um, the uh, coastline, and then uh, below where that person is standing, and then below that where the erosion has gone all the way back to the road. On the right are historical and projected future shorelines for the community of Newtok. These images make the complexity of this problem more tangible than pictures of buildings falling into the ocean. These are impacts happening with the rapidly changing climate of now in communities around Alaska's coasts, not some impact that comes with climate change several decades from now. The combination of changing sea ice, sorry, the combination of changing sea ice, thawing permafrost, erosion, and the nature of regional storms creates hazards in Western Alaska. As the sea ice season decreases due to atmosphere and ocean warming, and as the stability of the shoreline is decreased due to permafrost thaw, also due to warming, erosion can occur over more of the year and at a faster rate than during recent historical times. This erosion proceeds both gradually, but also much faster during large storms that occur during the autumn and early winter months. While there is no currently detectable trend in the frequency and magnitude of these storms, the coastal vulnerability to them has increased because of the sea ice and permafrost changes. The impact is thus one of current, not future, climate 
Okay, now, yes, next slide. More recently, synthesis of the community by community vulnerabilities from observations indicate dozens of communities are currently vulnerable to erosion, either river or coastal flooding. Sorry, I'm a slide behind you. Either river or coastal flooding or some combination of all three. The mechanisms vary with the community and location, but all are related to combinations of climatically driven weather and ocean hazards. It's beyond the scope of our time today to discuss them all, so I'll begin this with a sobering thought. The cost of relocating communities is in the tens to hundreds of millions of dollars each. New talks move to Matarvik is estimated to cost in that range. Melvin et al. in a paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in 2017 estimated that the cumulative instruct infrastructure impacts between 2015 and 2099 without adaptation would be $4.3 billion for a lower emissions scenario and $5.5 billion for a higher emissions scenario in 2015 dollars. According to their analysis, adaptation could reduce that by roughly 40%. Okay, next slide. Alaska is warming faster than the rest of the country, but that warming isn't the same across a place as large and topographically diverse as Alaska. So even at a first order, the, rot, the risks, mechanisms, and timing of impacts and their adaptation solutions aren't one size fits all. What you see here is a map of Alaska with 13 climate divisions for the state. Each of those climate divisions has a number in it, and that number represents the rate of warming in that region of Alaska relative to the rest of the United States. It shows you that in the lower latitudes of Alaska and in the southern coasts, the rate of warming is faster than the lower 48, and it's much faster uh, up on the north slope uh, in the north of Alaska. Next slide. Alaska is warming faster than the rest of the country, um, but in the future we expect increases in temperature over the, the state as well. Each of these climate divisions that I spoke about on the last slide also has a number in it on this slide, and that number is the increase in temperature in Fahrenheit expected for that part of Alaska under a high emissions uh, scenario consistent with RCP 8.5 and averaged across five different climate models for the period 27 to 2099. So the rate of increase in temperature is higher in those faster warming parts of the state than it is in the, uh, the lower parts of the state. On the other hand, the impacts to things like permafrost and potentially sea ice vary across the state as well. And those areas that are closest to freezing historically have the currently fastest rate of impacts. And so it's a mistake to think that only uh, the North Slope, for example, would have really large impacts of climate change on permafrost. In fact, these impacts are distributed across the state um, for different processes. Next slide. In all cases, the rate of warming is likely to continue and will result in considerable further warming. The impacts to permafrost uh, on the North Slope, for example, are evident in the rates of erosion that have been calculated on the north coast of Alaska. In the map on the lower right, you can see uh, in the reds the fat areas of fastest rates of erosion uh, using uh, modern data from maps and from satellite and aerial imagery, as well as on the ground measurement. This is the part of Alaska for which we have the best and most consistent record of erosion rates and where they're best able to be established. In places where we have that long history of shoreline and permafrost data, those rates of erosion can be calculated and we're one step closer to doing better modeling of the rate of erosion we might expect with future changes. Much of the western coast of Alaska, for example, doesn't have the observations needed to conduct these kinds of analyses. And so the uh, ability to project there has lagged behind, for example, that good work on the North Slope. Here you see a picture uh, that should illustrate, in case you're not familiar with what this looks like, the erosion that occurs on shorelines where there's permafrost underneath. Uh, you can just barely see in the middle of that photo um, the, the permafrost structure underneath that, that grassy tundra surface and then the erosion going on in the bluffs below. Okay, historically much of Alaska had a climate that supported permafrost or frozen ground that persists for more than two years. However, in many communities along the coast, permafrost is thawing with direct impacts on ground stability and infrastructure. Uh, 
These trends are likely to continue under a range of future warming scenarios. In this slide, you see four different emissions, four different future climate scenarios for two different climate models and two different emission scenarios. These are from a paper published by Melvin et al. in 2017. And the take home message from them is that especially on the west coast of Alaska and in the southwest part of the state, you see changes in what's called the active layer thickness, an indicator of the seasonal surface melt depth each year. And it's projected to increase in those places with red colors. The near surface permafrost thaw would be essentially complete in those by the end of the 21st century, resulting in increased threats to infrastructure and, and hazards. As a result, erosion, subsidence, and slumping would continue or possibly accelerate. The thaw is projected over the entire West Coast under a higher emissions scenario and a warmer model. So you can see there are a range of possible future scenarios. In many cases, from a community perspective, we don't necessarily know uh, or haven't measured what the impacts are, even though we know um, from first observation that there are uh, effects on infrastructure and community um, uh, relevant resources. Next. Historically, shore fast ice protected the coast from erosion, but the ice free season is increasing and projected to continue to increase. This is a graph from Rick Toman and ACAP at University of Alaska Fairbanks illustrating the observed change in the sea ice free season. Ice free conditions in the Bering, Chukchi, and Beaufort seas are projected to increase roughly one week per decade south of latitude 60 north and about two weeks per decade north of latitude 65 north under future climate. The Melvin et al. paper makes the case that many hundreds of meters of coastline would erode under those scenarios beyond the historical observations we've already seen. This would result in a considerably longer ice-free season during which the storms, usually in fall and winter, of even historical magnitude would be more likely to cause erosion and flooding events. So you see the interaction between the sea ice and the permafrost as being important. Uh, as the permafrost thaws, the ground structure becomes less stable, and then it becomes more exposed to storms due to the sea ice changes. Even if those storms don't increase in magnitude or frequency, you still have a more vulnerable coastline than you did previously. Next. Precipitation over the land surface also contributes to coastal flooding, especially in river slough communities and in short steep watersheds like those in Southeast Alaska. Precipitation in general, and also extreme precipitation events are expected to increase substantially under climates expected into the 21st century. The maps on the right show you uh, a lower emissions and a higher emissions change in the frequency of extreme precipitation events. What used to be a, historically a one in 20 year event doubles in much of Alaska under lower emissions consistent with RCP 2.6. Under higher emissions, the frequency of these events becomes much more frequent, one in five in Southeast Alaska, and as frequent as one in three in parts of the YK Delta and Western Alaska. So the increase in precipitation, especially extreme precipitation, presents an increase in the, the flooding expected um, in some of these coastal and, and river mouth communities where uh, the land surface precipitation provides a, an element of the flood risk too, not just storm surge. Next. The combination of prioritization, for example, the Denali Commission's Ranked Vulnerability Index of Communities Experiencing Erosion, and shovel-ready um, uh, opportunities uh, to adapt um, when um, funding becomes available proceed in, in a piecemeal fashion. Uh, many of the um, opportunities in Alaska have not been as well coordinated across the many communities that need access to them as we might hope. Ideally, for adaptation perspectives, uh, I the hazard projections and data would result in risk maps for existing communities and potential relocation sites. Um, on the right is an example from the community of Quinnahawk in Alaska, where the colors represent detailed risk um, of flooding by elevation in the community. The elevation relief in many of these communities is only a couple of meters, and so it's very difficult to do adequate, uh, ma uh, adequate flood pr uh, predictions based on certain storm surge heights if you don't have the local community elevations mapped adequately. Uh, satellite remote sensing has provided some uh, forward progress on this, which I'll talk about in a second, but we don't have it for every community. Much of coastal Alaska does not have adequate elevation data um, to project community level flood, flood risks. Shorelines are also changing so quickly, both in position and topography, that baseline, if it existed historically in terms of measurement, 
is now fluid and repeat observation is, is often required. A number of community collaborations within Alaska um, combining state and federal and tribal entities are collaborating to meet these needs, but the rate of change and the absence of even basic data represent considerable challenges. Next. The solution to these problems aren't just scientific or uh, engineering challenges to be met though, that helps. Perhaps first and foremost, the same climate, climate drivers of geomorphological coastal erosion and change are also changing the basis for indigenous food and energy security as climate changes the habitat and ranges of traditional subsistence species and the transportation options for getting fuel when renewables are not available. And all of these changes are occurring in a context where communities are still emerging from the effects of rapid historical changes that resulted in challenges even in the absence of climate change. Finally, decision making for Alaska Native communities involves complex interplay between tribal communities, Native corporations, and individuals. In short, the human dimensions of resilience determine the adaptive capacity and the options to respond to the physical and ecological challenges of climate change. So food and energy security and the issues of decolonization and sovereignty also uh, create part of this context and then define the context in which adaptation can occur. Next, please. There are some information successes to help address these problems. Better community level planning and adaptation depends in part on scientific advances. For example, if SAR or remotely sensed elevation information from radar was completed in 2019 for the uh, Yukon Kuskokwim Delta and thus completes Alaska's data set for this important elevation information. Funding and the development of elevation data allowed erosion or elevation models in many of these uh, regions for the first time. This data is a start to better simulation modeling of flooding, but it's insufficient for most community level needs because of the error even in this modern technology. There are many such steps forward in progress and anticipating piecing them together or integrating them to do better modeling, forecasting, and to solve problems of relevance to people and wildlife is key. There's also a bright spot in terms of capacity to bridge between Western science and indigenous knowledge. An example is the BIA tribal climate science liaison who's worked hard in our state to better coordinate efforts to put Western science and indigenous knowledge um, together in order to uh, create better adaptation opportunities for communities statewide. Another example is National Weather Service, service community partnerships with observers in, in some of the more remote communities to get better understanding of real-time impacts of forecasted events. And then scientific capability proceeds um, with new capabilities all the time. Our forecasting capabilities are improving and our coastal mapping improves all the time thus increasing our, uh, our ability to put data together and do a better job of bridging between um, the historical past and being prepared for the future climate change impacts that we expect to coastal resilience. And with that, I'll conclude my remarks and pass it back to Dan. Thanks, Jeremy. That was a great presentation to kick us off today. I uh, really appreciate it. Um, just a quick reminder, I know I had a couple things that um, I'm looking forward to asking you about, Jeremy, when we get to Q&A. For those of you who are uh, watching us online, if you have questions, there are two ways you can ask them. Uh, the first is to follow us on Twitter at ESI Online and submit your questions that way. Second way is to send us an email and you can reach us at ESI at ESI.org. Um, and we're gonna, we're gonna save all the questions. They're coming in fast and furious and we'll, we'll save them until we finish our finish up with the panel. Our next panelist is Raymond Paddock III. Ray works for the Central Council, Clinkett and Haida Indian Tribes of Alaska as their environmental coordinator. For several years, Ray has coordinated Clinkett and uh, uh, Haida, sorry, environmental program to provide training activities, educational assistance and coordination statewide and regionally. The Native Lands and Resources Department continues to contribute to the capacity growth within Alaskan tribes and provides a wide variety of services to assist those tribes as they address local and regional environmental issues. Ray is also serving as the Regional Tribe Operations Committee. Ray, I'll turn it over to you. Looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, Dan. Hi, uh, my name is Ryan Paddock again. I am the Environmental Coordinator for the Central Council of Clinket and Haida in Juneau, Alaska. Uh, I am a Clinket Indian. I'm Kogwantan of the Eagle's Nest House, and my Clinket name is Kusatan. Uh, I'm here to talk a little bit about the work that is being done in Alaska, but also to express the concerns in preparation and the lack of resources we have here. Next slide, please. Uh, 
Sorry, there we go. Yeah. Uh, there are 575 federally recognized tribes in the United States. 229 of those federally recognized tribes are here in Alaska. Many along the coast, but we do have several that are in the heart of Alaska. Next slide, please. As stated, there are many, many tribes within Alaska that are inland, uh, but they are dependent on the coastal resources. As you see on the map there, um, that's those colors here, you see the, the Yukon River. Uh, those, are, those are communities that are dependent on salmon that come from, that, to sustain their cultural and feed their communities. Excuse me. Uh, next slide, please. Subsistence resources. This means hunting, fishing, gathering activities that provide food and a way of life to Alaska natives. Healthy fish, wildlife, and plant populations are key to tribal communities. Uh, these are just some of the impacts that we have concerns with when talking about um, subsistence resources. Climate impacts to, to traditional gatherings on the calendar, uh, maintaining uh, berry species, impacts to salmon, and impacts to special for forest products like cedar. Next slide, please. I titled this one Woosh In. That's a clinket word for working together. Um, we are having to do a lot of working together, as you'll see later in the slides, to offset costs, share resources, and develop partnerships. Tribes, we have to come together to work on common issues across traditional regions, and that is what my work has been over a number of years. It's to fill in the slots where we are lacking some of the resources to build partnerships. Um, I'll get to some of that later. Uh, down in the presentation as we go on, but again, this is to uh, address cost issues and the lack of resources. Uh, next slide, please. So identifying our issues. Um, we see a lot of stuff in your face, as you see on the slides here, um, erosion, permafrost. For many of us, we do see that, um, and the, the rest of the world sees what's happening in Alaska, but many of us don't see the issues that are, are not as in your face as you see with the permafrost and the erosions here in the pictures. Uh, people are generally familiar with the needs of villages at risk from coastal erosion and inundation, particularly in western and northern Alaska, as Jeremy stated in, uh, in the previous speaker. And those are super pressing. Next slide, please. Yet there are broader risks, less in your face, if you will, from things like harmful algal blooms, ocean acidification that affects security, food security for all tribes, regardless of the locations across the state. As stated earlier, many communi communities in Alaska are dependent on coastal resources. In this slide, you'll see to the left, those are phytoplankton. One of them at the top is Alexandrium, which is the PSP we are typically seeing here in Southeast Alaska and, and along coastal Alaska uh, as harmful algal blooms. <clears throat> to the right, on that other side of the pick is um, ocean acidification testing. That's um, my co-workers, as you see at the top, they're, they've been doing some testing for um, ocean acidification in the Juneau area. Um, I also added a picture of the Alaska Marine Highway as they have been um, in integral part as um, data collecting for ocean acidification uh, for a number of years now. Um, unfortunately, unfortunately, um, the ferry system is in jeopardy, as many may know, so we don't know how that will look. Next slide, please. Barriers. Even with communities and tribes being somewhat prepared with development of adaptation plans, we are still lacking the resources needed to ensure we are addressing these issues. In terms of food security and adaptation capacity, we plan to have that for the future. We plan to slow, we have to plan for slow moving disasters that we don't expect or experience, that we don't expect, pardon me, and we don't have the experience with the bureaucracy that exists. Their mandates and regulations come from past and not future that we are trying to adapt to. Even though we have organizations like Clinton, Hyde, and Cedar, it's not enough. Even with the tribes in Alaska, if, even if all the tribes in Alaska had the capacity, it still would not be enough. We are lacking the resources. Pardon me. Next slide, please. And amidst all the entities that are working on coastal resilience and adaptation, Indigenous people offer something unique. 
and that is the perspective of being an integral part of Alaska ecosystems for millennia. There is no substitute for the knowledge that tribes hold about the land and the resources around their communities when it comes to resilience and adaptation. Yet many times this knowledge is not considered when agencies and other government entities launch adaptation planning efforts to aim to benefit these communities. Next slide, please. So a little bit more about the in-depth stuff of regional efforts that we are doing. And, and as you see on this slide here, there's, these are just um, a few of um, organizations and tribes that are working together to address tribal resiliency, community resiliency. Um, of course, there are several more throughout the state, but uh, this just was a quick slide we wanted to add in. Next slide, please. So as mentioned, there has been several organizations and tribes doing stuff to address tribal resiliency, community resiliency. Uh, Clink and Haida, we just recently developed an, a climate change adaptation plan based off tribal and cultural concerns. Um, fish, shellfish, cedar, we're on there just to name a few. And we got all that from a regional effort from tribes uh, who were able to hand in their concerns talk to us about their, their problems they're seeing in their communities, and that's how we drafted this adaptation plan. Um, we did so, um, pardon me, this plan was released to tribes uh, back in the spring of 2019, and we also created a template. Uh, next slide, please. So not, so this, so, we do have the adaptation plan for Clink and Haida, but there is a bigger plan. There's a template that we were able to give to tribes throughout Southeast. They were able to take that plan and make it a filler in, if you will, for the rest of the tribes based off their concerns and their communities that their tribal leaders may see as fit. In this slide, um, I want to talk a little bit about what we're doing next. So this year, we're developing another climate change adaptation plan. This one will be based off the social and economic impacts we are seeing in Southeast Alaska. So we, in order for this plan to go through, we are working with municipalities, small businesses, organizations throughout the region that may feel the effects of climate change down the road. Um, amidst COVID though, we're having a little bit of issues of trying to figure out what that, what that will look like, but we still have to reach out to those communities, to those municipal leaders, to the tribal leaders, and the small businesses to get their concerns in order for us to develop this plan properly. Next slide, please. And another organization, CTOR, um, ran from the Sitka Tribe of Alaska uh, with some food security marine programs. We are working with partners like STA here, the Sitka Tribe of Alaska, to ensure that we are meeting the issues of our food security. They, do, they conduct the um, shellfish harmful algal blooms and ocean acidification testing that many of our subsistence gatherers in Southeast Alaska use. We send those to Sitka Tribe and they're able to, to collect and tell us whether it's safe or not. But they're also collecting the data on ocean acidification. So that's a helpful part in, in the short term. Uh, we hope to use that bigger in the long run. Next slide, please. As mentioned also, um, I am part of the EPA Region 10 Tribal Operations Committee. We are in partnership with the United States EPA to further tribal environmental objectives at the regional level, to serve as a liaison, if you will, between the EPA and the tribes regarding information exchange, um, assistance, and, and to address issues that we see in our region, in Region 10 being uh, Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and Alaska. Um, right now, we, we are currently drafting and working with the regional director, if you will, to, uh, of EPA to create a, a subsistence initiative. And I'd like to show that more. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to, to um, ask on, on here. But we are creating a subsistence initiative that addresses issues such as climate change um, throughout all of Region 10. And of course, we would love feedback on that in the long run. Um, two more slides, uh, next slide. And, and um, uh, here, I just made it a, a quick Quick note of what's going on amidst COVID before I end, I wanted to just uh, put this out there, uh, current COVID considerations. At least 130 tribes right now have released orders requesting folks from outside of their communities to not, to not enter. If any of this audience please has oversight over our operations in Alaska uh, to result in villages visits, please, please check in with your programs and urge them 
to follow the tribal orders. Um, next slide. And uh, that is all. Ganesh Chish, Hawa. Um, thank you very much. My contact info is on here. Please feel free to contact me at any time. Um, thank you, guys. Thanks, Ray. Uh, great presentation. And just as a reminder, um, everyone's slides uh, are actually already online. So if you need Ray's contact information, uh, if you want to go back and look at his slides, same thing with Jeremy, same thing with Aaron, who's coming up next. Everything's available online at EESI.org. Um, and, uh, and the video will, will eventually be up there as well. Um, just a quick reminder for those who might have joined us a little late, we're going to save our Q&A for the end. If you have questions you'd like to ask our panelists, and many of you are submitting them, uh, you can send them into us via Twitter or um, follow us online, uh, ESI online on Twitter. You can um, you know, uh, DM, DM us or you can retweet or you can want to get us in that way. You can also send us an email at EESI at EESI.org. We're going to move to our third panelist and then we'll move into our Q&A portion of the day. Our third panelist is Aaron Poe. Aaron has worked in Alaska for 22 years specializing in natural resource management, partnership development, and community engagement. His work focuses on helping managers and communities understand and adapt to rapid environmental change. He currently works for the Alaska Conservation Foundation, and he is the coordinator for the Aleutian Bering Sea Initiative and program officer for the Sustainable Southeast Partnership. Welcome, Aaron. Really glad to have you today. Great. Thanks, Dan. Um, yeah, and thank you for that intro. Um, I, I'm excited to be able to talk with folks today uh, about a couple of these partnerships um, that I support here uh, from my position at the Alaska Conservation Foundation. And so I guess uh, let's let's jump right in. Next slide, please. And so the one I'm going to spend the most time talking about is this uh, Aleutian Bering Sea Initiative. Uh, and that was one of the original landscape conservation cooperatives. So if folks have maybe heard of that or heard of LCCs, um, essentially, these are regional partnerships. They're guided by steering committees, and, and those steering committees include folks from agencies, from tribes, from indigenous organizations, from nonprofits, from university programs, basically really diverse groups of people that are directing the work of these partnerships. I always like to stress first off that they are non-regulatory. These are public-private partnerships, but when you walk through the door and you come to the, that table of that partnership, that steering committee, you're an equal with everyone there. So whether you work for an agency and have some sort of regulatory authority, that's not important at those tables. And I think this is one of the things that particularly our tribal partners find refreshing as a different way um, to interact with some of their, their peers and colleagues that are within agencies. These partnerships focus on large scale issues. So things exactly like you know, coastal resilience, climate adaptation, basically the types of things that no one can really handle on their own. No entity, no individual has the ability to address these levels of change. Um, I always, you know, basically just to kind of honor the origins of these, there were 22 of these partnerships at one time. They were launched by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in 2010. Uh, they covered all of the entire United States. They covered uh, much of Canada. They were in the Pacific Islands, throughout the Pacific Islands. They were also throughout the Caribbean. Um, as of today, there are, and, and at one time there were five of these partnerships uh, in Alaska. As of today, there are three that are left due to basically changes that were made in funding at the federal level um, resulted in sort of the erosion of what had been this original network of LCCs. We've now kind of rebranded ourselves. We're talking this kind of Northern Latitudes partnerships is sort of the umbrella we talk about under. So we have that Aleutian Bering Sea Initiative in yellow on your map there. Western Alaska LCC still has that uh, moniker attached to it in green and the Northwest Boreal Partnership. Uh, and I just want to highlight that that Northwest Boreal Partnership, the one that you see in purple there, uh, actually has a joint steering committee of made up of Alaskans and individuals from three different provinces in Canada. So it's an international partnership uh, working on these types of issues. Um, so despite the kind of changes that happened in 2017 with funding, you know, these partnerships continue. We currently have about 150 different partners, either serving in, the, serving in those steering committee roles or on individual projects. And we continue to build on sort of the nine years of trust um, you know, that were launched in, in uh, 2010 uh, by, these, uh, by these partnerships. Next slide, please. So the work of, of these former LCC partnerships, 
um, largely had been focused on science to the beginning. So the numbers that you see here on the slide in the, in the first five years, those were actually summary numbers from a, uh, an evaluation that was done by the National Academy of Sciences in 2015. Basically, Congress had requested uh, a special analysis of, these, of this network of partnerships to see if they were actually contributing something new and unique and useful to the US. And they were, uh, that was the findings of those anal that analysis. Um, kind of after 2015, I felt the partnerships, particularly here in Alaska, shifted more towards this kind of adaptation and these kind of resilience type actions. So we've kind of moved away from so much of the science uh, and more towards trying to help people, you know, adapt to the changes that are happening. And currently, I just want to point out there's about 220 projects um, under the belt, I suppose, of these uh, of these partnerships. Next slide. So I, I also want to just acknowledge the, the members of the steering committees here. Um, at, at one point, when all five LCCs in Alaska were intact, there were um, 49 different entities that were serving. You'll see this is a mix of Alaskan and Canadian uh, folks. Um, currently, with the kind of reduced number of these partnerships that we have, we have three steering committees remaining. We still have about 37 different partners that are active here. Next, please. And so our host organizations currently um, are the Alaska Conservation Foundation, where I work. Um, and the Alaska Conservation Foundation has been around for about 40 years. We're focused on public lands and waters and the ways of life that they support here in Alaska. The Wildlife Management Institute has been around for about 120 years. And basically, they've worked as a nonprofit uh, supporting the needs of various state fish and game agencies across the country. Our principal funder right now uh, is the Volgenau Foundation. It had been the Fish and Wildlife Service, and now this small family foundation is trying to uh, to keep us supported. They're based in Washington, DC. They focus on the conservation of natural resources and the education of children. And we're very grateful for their support that they've directed to the Alaska Conservation Foundation to sustain these partnerships. So I'm just gonna transition here, to talk a little bit about some of the work that we do within the LCCs. Uh, and so this one example shows you stellar sea lions, those handsome fellows that you see there um, on your screen. Basically, this is a really important traditionally harvested subsistence species. Ray introduced that concept to folks that maybe are familiar with it, but an essential species that the Anungan or Aleut people in the Aleutian Islands have relied upon for thousands of years. One of the other things people maybe don't know about a remote place like the Aleutian Islands, it also hosts one of the largest shipping lanes in the United States, in the world, basically, where lots of the stuff that shipped between Asia and North America comes right through the Aleutian Islands. So we were able to do with one of our first projects this kind of proximity analysis, those shipping lanes that you see there in red, um, basically looking at the distance between those and some of these haul-outs for, for stellar sea lions. And we we're able to basically show kind of both industry and managers that, hey, if you just bump those kind of lines a little bit further away from those, uh, those haul-outs, you, you could really increase the amount of safety, not only for your crews and your ships and your vessels, but also for the species in terms of you know, risk from oil spills or other types of disturbance. So if you look at the next slide, um, basically working through uh, this partnership, we were able to give this information to the Coast Guard, which uh, took that kind of analysis that we had done on the previous slide to the International Maritime Organization. And we were able to get these kind of five voluntary areas to be avoided established in the Aleutians. I'll stress again, this is voluntary, not necessarily regulatory, um, in that basically we were able to show the insurance companies for these vessels that if you can bump those vessels just that much further away from those islands, you really reduce your exposure of risk and increase the, the safety of the, the transit itself. And so kind of building on that, if you go to the next slide, we have this new effort um, where we're really trying to create, we're kind of focus, continue to focus on this kind of dynamic separation uh, or creating more separation between sort of vessels and marine mammals, or also in the case of subsistence harvesters. Um, but sort of, you know, it's kind of a neat one where it's, it's this kind of high-tech collaboration that allows agencies and tribes to basically establish areas in the kind of coastal environment where they want to learn more about potential risks from vessel traffic. And how it works is essentially with these polygons that you can kind of see there on the map, or at least the you know, conception of them around the walrus and around the harvester, is that every time a large vessel enters one of those, that manager or that tribe can get an email or a text message saying, hey, there's a vessel in this area. And that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to trigger some kind of regulatory action. It's really just trying to increase uh, domain awareness. And this kind of like dynamic solution, I think, is really important because as we're looking at changes in sea ice, we're basically seeing vessel traffic in new areas. We're seeing species having to shift to change to new habitats that are, you know, align with the ways that they have evolved. And so this kind of thing 
um, allows managers to kind of keep on top of that, allows tribes to keep on top of that. I also like to highlight this one just because it is an interesting collaboration. We worked with industry nonprofits, so nonprofits that serve the maritime industry on this. And my kind of favorite little fun fact about this is it was funded by the Department of Homeland Security and the Wildlife Conservation Society. I think it might be the only project in the world uh, with that distinction. Next slide. So one of the kind of signature um, efforts of these former LCC partnerships was in 2016, three of them working with the uh, Aleutian Pribilof Islands Association and a whole bunch of other partners um, was able to host this series of coastal resilience and adaptation workshops. This occurred in five communities across the state. And essentially the aim here was to try and bring forward as, as kind of science providers or these partnerships that are composed of science providers to try and share what information was available in terms of data, information, tools, maybe funding opportunities, try and bring that to communities to share, but spend an equal amount of time really listening to the communities about, hey, we brought you this wonderful stuff on coastal erosion, but what is it that you really need? And hearing things that maybe what we really need are sustainable jobs in our community. So really being open to that, maybe kind of shedding a little bit of what we think everyone needs to know and really spending time listening to what we what they're telling us they need. Um, so this was an enormous effort. You can see from kind of the number of participants, but really the diversity of affiliation of those participants, I think is what made it pretty unique. Um, unfortunately, with the changes at the federal level in 2017, a number of the efforts that had been planned to come out of these workshops um, you know, were, were derailed. Um, and if we go to the next slide, I will um, just mention one effort that persisted. One of the key things we heard during all of those workshops was that folks don't have a common place that they can go to access tools, data, information, resources about adaptation. Uh, so we launched this adaptalaska.org. Um, again, with grand visions of a, a number of contributing federal partners here. Um, unfortunately, at this point, it's basically Alaska Sea Grant that is uh, holding this thing together. They, they've launched a new version of it. They're doing a great job in terms of trying to share, you know, basically success stories, tools, resources. Um, but, but certainly, you know, they're doing a great job with the capacity they have. And there's a lot of great ways we could develop this site. Um, and we're continuing to explore kind of resources for that. If you do next slide. So kind of one of the last efforts I want to talk about in terms of a project, this is something that's common to all of those former LCC partnerships. And this Indigenous Sentinels Network, I think, is pretty unique and interesting. It was launched by the Aleut community of St. Paul, so the tribal community that's based in the Pribilof Islands, basically a picture of the kind of the middle of the Bering Sea in some ways. Um, and it was launched in 2002. Originally, it was kind of powered by you know, paper and pencil, um, you know, it, it spread out of that region. It's progressed in terms of its technological sophistication. There's now a smartphone app that communities can use. Um, that smartphone app hosts several different kind of common protocols, even some of the stuff that like the agencies use, say the, you know, the Marine Mammal Stranding Network, for example, or some of the protocols that the Fish and Wildlife Service uses to document uh, seabird die-offs on beaches. So it has those kind of protocols, but it also has some specific to the needs of communities. Um, so, for example, they've developed a, you know, a protocol that allows people to document um, the harvest of their traditional foods around their communities. Um, I think it's, it's unique in sort of this genre of, you know, kind of citizen science or community-based observer programs for, for a couple of reasons. Um, I think one is that the focus of what is collected, so the focus of the, you know, the science, the data collection is defined by the individual community. That community also owns the data that is collected and they are able to choose with whom they share or don't share that information. And I think another kind of final distinction is that the sentinels, the folks that are actually doing this work, just like you would pay a biological technician or a biologist or a geologist, those people are paid. Uh, and I think that's kind of unique among a lot of these community-based observer programs where the expectation a lot of times is that people are gonna volunteer their efforts. And I think that really helps to ensure that this effort has kind of a rigor to it. Um, and I, so I encourage people to check it out. Right now it's and it's bearingwatch.net. Something happened with the, the slide rendering there, but it's NET at the end. So I encourage you to check that out uh, and see how it's kind of expanded into this Indigenous Sentinels network now that it's in interior Alaska and actually looking at going into Canada as well. So if we go to the next slide. And so I just wanted to acknowledge, because one of my other roles is working with this sustainable Southeast partnership and the Southeast we're talking about here is Alaska. Um, and I think it has some really important lessons um, to be shared with these kind of former LCC partnerships and, you know, kind of key among those that there is this kind of interest in sort of localizing stewardship, like we just talked about with the Indigenous Sentinels Network. But I think a key component that this, that this partnership has, and it was a partnership of tribes and nonprofits in that region, is that they have a real focus on sustainable economic development for rural communities. And that's something that we hadn't had in the past 
uh, with some of these former LCC partnerships. And so we're hoping to kind of um, facilitate some learning between these folks on how we might tune up and really make those regional partnerships truly you know, addressing the whole system, which of course includes um, sustainable economy. So I encourage people to go to that, it's at sustainablesoutheast.net. There's a really great movie. It's definitely worth seven minutes of your time. Um, that talks about how this partnership is kind of unique. And I think there's some really good lessons from there, not only for just rural Alaska, but for rural US in general, and how these kind of small communities can go forward into this you know, kind of century, I suppose. Um, so kind of on that theme of lessons learned, maybe I, I will let, go on to my last few slides here and share some kind of observations. Um, and I'll attribute this quote that you see there uh, to a friend of mine named R Rochelle Daniel, who's with Pew, Pew Charitable Trust. Um, and I asked her kind of last week, like, hey, what are some key things you would share with an audience if you only had 15 minutes? And she's like, well, I think we might need a month. Uh, that was her response. So anyhow, I have this amount of time, so I will try my best. Um, but essentially, we heard kind of the data needs galore um, that Jeremy and Ray both have, have talked about in terms of how many of the common layers that really power adaptation efforts and power kind of scenario planning in lots of the rest of the country really don't exist for Alaska. And I, maybe I'll just offer one example. So folks might be familiar with something called the National Wetlands Inventory. This is essentially a GIS layer or a map of the wetlands of the United States. It really helps our communities. It helps our industry understand where they can um, develop facilities and infrastructure. Alaska has about 40% of our state covered by that National Wetlands Inventory. And unfortunately, the places that aren't covered are those that are most rapidly changing. So where communities like Jeremy talked about maybe need to adapt the most rapidly we actually don't have this basic layer that would really inform um, kind of their infrastructure. And it's $7 million, which, you know, maybe that's a large number to finish out, you know, the rest of, you know, the state that's two and a half times the size of Texas. Um, but it seems like it would save tens of millions uh, in planning and surveying costs. And it, it, it would definitely allow communities to move more quickly uh, in terms of their adaptation efforts. I do want to also share telecommunications is maybe the most consistent thing that we hear. I mean, look at the impacts of COVID, right? We're all talking to one another like this, and we expect this, oh, I can just zoom over for whatever reason. Well, those 229 tribal communities that Ray talked about, for a lot of them, this kind of capacity, uh, just in terms of internet speed, is not there. Uh, that limits them for telemedicine, that limits them for, you know, sessions like this or many other things um, that would help them adapt. And in some places, you know, in the state, phones aren't even necessarily completely reliable uh, all of the time. And often it's the school that maybe has the only good source of reliable internet. Um, the final point I'd make on this slide is that there really isn't any clearinghouse. There isn't this kind of, you know, simple place um, for, you know, tribes or, you know, even agency leaders to be able to go and access adaptation information, data, resources, funding sources. Um, you know, we tried to create this sort of adaptalaska.org with that in mind, but in so doing, we, you know, quickly realized that's a three to four person job in order to just stay on top of everything, to stay on top of the latest data, the latest success stories, the latest funding sources. Um, it, it would take a lot more uh, than what we have to power it currently. So next slide. In terms of barriers to, to collaboration, I, I mean, it feels so generic to complain about bureaucracy, but it, it, it's very real. Um, in terms of the financial assistance operations, particularly of the federal government right now, are so convoluted and slow, and they're getting increasingly so all of the time. It, it's really hard, I think, for agencies to be able to deploy their resources in an effective annual fiscal cycle, and they miss opportunities to partner with tribes, with universities, with state agencies, because of a number of these controls that are in place. Um, I would also point to the consistent thing we hear that, you know, communities don't have the resources that they need, and they don't have access to kind of the venues that they would need to be able to go to and be heard at um, to share what their real needs are. Communities often are referred to like, hey, go to this annual conference if you wanna learn about your adaptation needs or go here or go there. Um, but they're, they're telling us, we're hearing that they don't really feel that the way that conferences and workshops are run really allows for true exchange and ideas and listening and you know, eventual decision-making the way that tribes like to be able to do that. Um, we also hear consistently about communities just being kind of overrun by scientists and agencies who are coming to them with ideas, basically saying, hey, we want your input on this idea versus what is your idea of what you need? Um, and being able to flip that uh, just seems really vital in terms of kind of resilience and adaptation. I would also point there really isn't a central authority for leadership on adaptation in Alaska at all. 
Um, and that's not to blame anyone. I mean, I think people who are maybe passingly familiar with Alaska have heard things that's like, oh, the Denali Commission, that's who's handling all of that. Or maybe it's the, you know, Interagency Arctic Research Policy Committee or IARCPIC, you know, they're the ones that are the central authority on climate science. And so that's where these discussions are all happening. And the reality is it's not to put any shade or anything on those people, but that's not what's that's not true each one is working on their own little pieces they still kind of have their own mandates and their own space that they operate on and there's really not anyone that's putting it all together to understand what the full picture is next slide so just in in terms of the adaptations that are out there i mean you've, you've heard sort of jeremy and ray talk about examples of this and i just you know i hate to again to put like a but um on it but but there are some you know pretty significant butts uh in there and i i, I want to start this off just by sharing and it's kind of been shared earlier but climate change is really a lived experience for people particularly people in rural alaska they're literally changing the way that they live because of the changes that are happening around them and i think people want to do something about that there's individuals who want to change the way that they fish maybe they want to switch to mariculture um, because they're concerned about fishing futures. There's a lot of things that they're willing to do. They're willing to like roll up their sleeves and actually do the work. It's just that there's not great information on how to do that as an individual, how to change your business practices uh, relative to the, the changes in the environment that we're seeing. I do say, see also that there's this kind of, and it's been alluded to in the past, but or in the past presentations, but this kind of, there's an increased kind of recognition of the value of indigenous knowledge. I want to italicized like I didn't say increased meaning it's better than it used to be but it's not anywhere near where it needs to be um, and, and sadly there's kind of limited investment from sort of the science community or the agency community or decision maker community broadly in figuring out how could we connect this really important indigenous knowledge to kind of the science that typically has been driving management so much in the past um, key players in Alaska that basically have been excelling at this kind of stuff um, have seen funding cuts in recent years. Um, you know, at kind of the exact wrong time when these changes are happening so rapidly. So, you know, organizations like Alaska Sea Grant have seen funding cuts. Um, the EPA's kind of Indian General Assistance Program or the IGAP program that powers a lot of the tribal environmental efforts in communities has been cut in recent years as well. Um, and and not to you know focus on me poor me or anything but i think it's just a reality to acknowledge that you know even these former lcc partnerships i've been talking about there originally were 15 permanent full-time staff that were facilitating those uh functioning and looking for these project and adaptation opportunities now there's three folks that are all doing that from inside of those those um, nonprofit organizations alaska conservation foundation and wildlife management institute so that's a that's a big uh, sort of cut in terms of capacity. And then I guess maybe the, my kind of a final word on this um, is that there's a general sense um, that from especially some of the other private funders, so the larger foundations that fund a lot of science and adaptation efforts around the world, that Alaska is okay. Like Alaska is generally fine compared to other parts of the globe in terms of what the populations there are dealing with. And in, in reality, that may be very true, especially if you look at like the global south, for example, where resources are even scarcer. Um, but it's just a reality that, you know, the kind of the types of funding that we used to see from large foundations in Alaska in the early 2000s really just don't happen the way that they used to. One more slide. And I guess I'd, I'm kind of wrapping here a little bit. And I, I so I, I obviously just want to make this, you know, I am I'm not a climate scientist. Um, I've played one on the radio a couple of times on NPR, which was super cool. And once I did a local TV show in Unalaska Dutch Harbor. Hence my amazing presence on camera here. Um, but I have the good fortune to work with a lot of climate scientists. And so this is not to disparage any of their work, but it's it's my observation that the risk is always underestimated in their predictive climate models. And I don't know whether that's kind of the way that science works um, or whether agencies or universities don't wanna release products that maybe are too alarmist and they really just want two or three more peer reviews to make sure that that um, you know, those findings are correct and how that maybe like dampens the reality. But I guess I would just share that, you know, some of the things that our communities are saying they're seeing now were the types of things that were predicted to be happening in 2040. So it feels like, you know, Alaska is not just behind sort of in the investment in climate adaptation. It's maybe sort of ironic and sad that we're also behind the prediction curve in terms of what's happening under climate change. 
And last slide. So I guess I'll, I'll just close by sharing that and reinforcing that climate change and adaptation is a lived experience right now in Alaska. We can't wait for a change in administration. We can't wait for the newest and best science. Um, we can't wait for the best technologies for infrastructure to come forward. Uh, the challenges that our tribes and communities are facing, the challenges that our natural resource managers are facing are all happening. They have happened already, and they don't really show uh, any signs of slowing down here in the north. So thank you for your time and attention, folks. And I guess I think we're back to Dan for question and answer. Yes, I think that's right. Thank you, Aaron. And uh, we, I think we'll have, we have a full half hour for Q&A. So I'm really looking forward to this. And um, uh, I've got lots of questions, but I think I'm gonna start actually um, by first thanking the three of you for, for joining us today and for your um, really excellent presentations. Uh, one last plug, if anyone in our audience would like to submit a question, you can follow us on Twitter at ESI Online. Um, you can also send us an email, eesi at eesi.org. Um, but I think I'm going to kick off the Q&A, Aaron, by letting uh, or asking Jeremy and Ray if they would like to comment on some things in your presentation. And specifically, you identified, towards the end of your presentation, you identified three key barriers. Um, that you see as um, getting in the way uh, from uh, coastal resilience in Alaska. Um, and I'm going to paraphrase, but they were roughly, the first one was um, the lack of financial assistance, which often made it difficult to partner with federal authorities or federal agencies. Um, the second was, again, a lack of resources, but this time to participate in a lack of venues in order to be heard. Um, and then the lack of a central authority in Alaska for a lot of this work being done. And I'd like to ask Jeremy and Ray, Jeremy, we'll start with you since you went first, and then Ray will go to you. What do you make of those barriers? Are those, from your perspective, are those real barriers? Are there other barriers? Um, and, you know, if you have ideas about maybe how you would suggest removing those barriers, um, changing barriers into hurdles that can be overcome, um, interested in what you have to say about that. And Jeremy, we'll, we'll go to you first. Sure. I mean, I, I think, you know, and, and I think Aaron characterized it appropriately. Those things are, you know, there, there are limitations on what can be done and how well it can be done, particularly at the community level. And I think that's part of the story here is if, if all these places were the same, had the same hazards and risks, and we're subject to the same sets of impacts, it would be easier to look for that magical one size fits all or scalable solution. Um, but the truth is that, you know, there, there are, there's a lot of texture to those um, impacts and to the responses and the degree to which the communities are affected by some or all of them. And then also on the impacts um, to their food security and their livelihoods and, and so on. And so I think that, you know, you, you start to add up the, the requirements, the financial requirements of dealing with those problems, even developing the science um, that's capable of um, characterizing those nuances from community to community is, is an expensive proposition. And so, you know, we're, we also then are faced with a, an environment and um, in impacts that are changing rapidly enough that, you know, as soon as we've got elevation and shoreline characterization complete, we need to start again because it, it is eroding or, uh, or changing. And, uh, and so there's, there's also that element of needing to keep working on this. You're never, you're never quite done. And I, you know, that's no, not necessarily any less true in other parts of, of the world, but the impacts are happening so quickly here. And the, the baseline information is so limited that it, it's difficult. So from a scientific perspective, you know, the, the ability to fund and coordinate a wide range of projects to address specifically those community needs rather than merely the scientific curiosity that would um, naturally move us forward in kind of a piecemeal fashion um, is, is a limitation. Um, you also characterize the second one as, as sort of the capacity to be heard. You know, um, scientists are getting better at this over the decades, but historically we uh, attend conferences and work kind of in groups of our own, our, our peers that focus, um, you know, on the same things that we study. So we might go to a permafrost um, meeting if we're interested in permafrost or if we happen to have the good fortune to collaborate with people interested in permafrost thaw impacts on the global carbon cycle, it might get a little bit more um, diverse across disciplines. And then maybe 
Um, you know, at some of the larger conferences, we have sessions that are devoted to the interdisciplinary aspects of this, including the community impacts and what you do about it. And Aaron's right to point out that the dialogue has to be one of not just scientists, not just community members, not just funding agencies, not just policymakers, but really you need all aspects of that to fully appreciate the dimensions of the problem and then to imagine its solutions because none of them are just scientific, technological, community resilience or policy. There, there are pieces of all of that. And then third, you talked about a, a central authority to coordinate this. The, the adaptation efforts, and especially our understanding of how you co-produce science that's useful to the people who might benefit from it, that's evolving still because these are still early days in how we do this. There are you know, decades of adaptation um, in some places and in many of these communities, if you think about it in the long horizon, millennia of adaptation to environmental variability. On the other hand, it's a new kind of environmental variability there are new um, or relatively new, you know, century old or at the most century and a half um, dimensions of, of land ownership and regulation and uh, management mandates from different agencies. Those sorts of things are relatively novel. And so, um, you know, you're still working at coordinating all of those different pieces of the adaptation puzzle. And so far, it's been more, I don't know if you call it grassroots or bottom up, but it's, you know, Aaron can probably comment better or, or Ray, uh, but you have different entities coming to the table and carrying on the dialogues and trying to assemble the pieces from the bottom up. And the coordination happens in, in fits and starts rather than directed. Um, and we've seen some good examples on, you know, some of the scientific challenges, um, but uh, definitely there's, there's room going forward to do more of that. Ray, what do you think? What, what do you make of the bear, the three barriers that Aaron laid out? Pardon me? Say, I'm sorry, I could not hear you. Oh, that's no problem. Uh, what do you make of the three barriers that Aaron laid out and that Jeremy just commented on? A lack of financial assistance to work with federal agencies, a lack of resources and venues for ideas to be heard, and then sort of a lack of central authority to deal with some of these issues. Well, I don't know if I can have a, a, as uh, in-depth and uh, amazing answer to the question as Jeremy had, but um, <clears throat> we do see that there are definitely a lack of resources and, and a lack of uh, central authority. And, and that's why we've seen tribes, organizations, partnership together to, to address these issues because we're just not seeing it done on, on a, a larger scale. Um, Unfortunately, you know, we're, we're kind of by ourselves right now, but again, uh, coming together to offset costs, share resources is it's kind of been the theme we've been doing to, to address those issues on that large scale. Um, and we're having some success, but, uh, and it comes down as a grassroots level, as Jeremy was just saying, but um, in order for this to, to work on a, on a bigger level, we're gonna need the bigger players involved as well. Great, thanks. Um, Ray, I'm going to go to you with this one and then we'll, we'll ask Aaron and Jeremy to join in. But this is a question I was really looking forward to. This is a topic I was really looking forward to hearing about today. And it's a question that we've gotten online and it's a question that, that I've, I've had since we've started. And that is, all of you have mentioned to some degree sort of the Alaskan traditional ecological knowledge that has been sort of, you know, part of communities in Alaska for generations, centuries. And, you know, Aaron made the comment that it's increased, but it hasn't gotten to where it needs to be. I'm wondering if you could, how do we do better? How do we better include in the scientific uh, and uh, climate change adaptation conversation? How do we do better including traditional ecological knowledge, whether it's uh, from, you know, Alaskan tribes, um, like, the, the ones that you're working with, Ray, or just generally speaking, how do we involve sort of a native perspective in sort of a scientific climate change adaptation conversation? Dan, I think that's a, a question um, <clears throat> tribes and tribes have been trying to figure out for a number of years, if you will. Um, right now though, it's kind of an exciting time for, for tribes as we're seeing um, <clears throat> 
more of the, the work that we're doing that's um, had TEK involved, if you will. Sorry, uh, for there's a lot of people out there that will be upset with me using the words TEK. Indigenous knowledge, if you will. Uh, traditional and indigenous knowledge. Um, we're seeing that happen more and more um, over the last decade or so. And, um, and a lot of that has been with tribes being able to build their capacity um, to to um, implement Western science and traditional knowledge, indigenous knowledge together while developing programs such as what we've seen with CTOR or with what we at Clinton and Haida have been doing with the, the climate change adaptation plan. We're not just doing it on a tribal level, but we're reaching out to several organizations, businesses, gov governments, if you will, to, to get feedback on that. And, and it's bringing truth and light into the work that we are doing um, as we've been saying this for a century or more. Aaron, what, I mean, you were the one who, Aaron, you were the kind of one who brought up the idea that it's increasing, but isn't where it needs to be. So sort of what do you have to, to say sort of in response to Ray's comment and then Jeremy will go to you. Yeah, and I, I guess, again, not that funding is like the solution to everything. <laughs> Um, I think there's kind of two pieces to it, though, and one of them is funding, um, that you have institutions like the National Science Foundation. And so, for example, there's a there's a letter circulating right now um, from a, a couple of tribes and a number of um, tribal nonprofits or, you know, sort of basically highlighting a, a new program that the National Science Foundation rolled out here, the, the Navigating the New Arctic proposal. And they basically have some very specific recommendations for how NSF could literally fund kind of the, the I mean, infrastructure is not the right word, but I mean, sort of like the the venues, the, the knowledge exchange opportunities um, between Indigenous peoples and scientists. So I think there literally is a funding piece to it. Um, but I also feel like there's a there's an education, there's sort of a Western science education that you know, I, I was trained as a scientist and that was a while ago, but I, I'm kind of guessing that it might not have changed that much that there's not a value put on sort of the experience that indigenous peoples have and the, the fact that they actually do have this knowledge and this information that you might have to spend science uh, effort on. They actually have this information. And so finding a way to kind of train or maybe retrain um, you know, our fellow scientists in how they can do this kind of co-production of knowledge work with indigenous communities um, is also needed. And Jeremy, from your perspective working with the federal government, what, what do you, what's your perspective on this? How, how could the sort of the scientific community, you know, do what Aaron just suggested and what Ray suggested and sort of embrace this knowledge base that's just sitting there sort of, um, sort of demanding to be heard, but some reason not quite being heard yet. Yeah, I've had the good fortune to work with um, a small handful of, of communities uh, in Western Alaska and South, Southwestern Alaska um, and, and listen to the lifetime observations of, of some of the elders in those communities and then also the, the traditional knowledge or indigenous knowledge, as, as Ray pointed out, um, that, uh, that they carry forward from previous generations. And I've been frequently um, surprised both at the depth and quality of, of that information, especially on things like weather dynamics um, and how they've changed or currents in the, the ocean or in, in rivers, river river and changes, erosion changes, things like that that are relevant to our discussion here. And um, the I, my training initially was as a paleoecologist and we're always looking for records of, of reliable information or proxies um, for processes that happened before there were instrumental observations. And uh, we spent a lot of time understanding what that past environment looked like. And in many of these cases, I have you know, access to and, and have benefited from information um, fr from direct observation that goes back before instrumentation was available on the west coast of Alaska. So it provides a good context. I think it's um, a little bit counter to our um, training that we receive in, in what we might think of as Western science, our, our classical uh, training, uh, in how to use both kinds of information simultaneously. And it's, it's a challenge to do that. But if you go in with the idea that a scientist goes in with that those are um, plausible and that the observations that are made 
um, are things that get tested against future observations, then there's a very similar framework for how you proceed. And so I think there's a lot of value in, um, in, in using both kinds of information as we move forward. And especially given that the, the future environment that we'd anticipate and even the current changes happening in, in many parts of Alaska um, exceed the, the kinds of, of, of Western science um, observations in the historical record or are different from those uh, in the, in the, in the uh, indigenous knowledge. Uh, that are described, but those changes often give us ideas for the things that we should be uh, looking at before we, we know that there's a problem. Yeah, it's almost like they, they should, it's, it's not one or the other, right? It's both, right? Exactly. It can be two things, as they say. Yeah. Um, my next, so we have a lot of questions and we're not going to get to all of them, but thank you for everyone who's contributed to them. Um, Here's one for you, and I know this is a controversial topic. It's one that we sort of wrestle with at ESI about how to talk about um, with our panelists, with our experts, with our community leaders, but also with policymakers. And that is the idea of relocating communities, moving away from um, you know air, coastline areas that are at risk. And this came up, um, Ray, I think it came up in your slide, uh, Jeremy's as well, for coastal communities that need to relocate. What does that actually look like? in Alaska. I ex uh, Ray, I think you said it was very expensive. Um, or maybe that was Jeremy's, uh, sorry, it was an hour and 15 minutes ago, perhaps. But in addition to sort of the financial requirements of moving a community, um, you know, communities, these, these are communities that are so tied to the shoreline and specifically their coast, right, their portion of it. What does that look like? How does that conversation even get started? And, you know, how do you mobilize sort of the resources, the vast resources, financial and otherwise, that it takes to get that done. And um, anyone can pipe up, but Ray, since I've taken your slides in vain a couple times, maybe we'll start with you and then we'll go to Aaron and to Jeremy. Well, um, <clears throat> so where I'm from in Southeast Alaska, you know, we're not really seeing a lot of the the, uh, the erosion, the, the, this, the water taking communities away yet. Um, so that's a hard one for me to answer, but, um, it's still, you know, uh, <laughs> I, I'm kind of lost where I wanted to go with that. There was something I wanted to say in regards to that. I know that, um, I, to start though, I mean, again, we'd have to look at Kivalina and Shishmaroff and, and see too that, you know, they knew it was coming, but the rest of the state didn't have a plan for that. Uh, I just wanted to reiterate though, too, and, and this goes back to Jeremy's point of cost of having an adaptation plan could possibly reduce about 40% of you know, the, the issues that may arise, be it from village relocation, community relocation to um, building you know, maybe walls or something to the effect. But um, I am bringing it back to the, the financial part of things just because I've, you know, I've not experienced that, I've not dealt with that part in, in Southeast Alaska, fortunately. But it still, again, doesn't mean that there's underlying issues that we haven't addressed or can't see or, or can't address. My apologies for not answering Great, thanks. that. Thanks. No, not at all. Uh, and I should say that the person asked who asked that question also gave you a shout out for amazing plankton slides. <laughs> 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 so all it's all great. So um, Aaron, why don't we go with you to, to you next? Um, sort of what, what does it take for some of these communities to, you know, to either yeah. uh, sort of get their heads around it or even just to, to actually make the move? It, yeah, it's a uh, speaking of another month long conversation. <laughs> it, it, it's a huge question and topic. Um, I mean, it, and it, I guess, and. So there's a whole bunch of pieces to it, but I mean, one of the guess kind of problems that I would point to is this kind of there isn't there's there there's some collaboration around it, but there's a lot of competing mandates um, and sort of jurisdictions that basically make it this really prolonged and painful process. I think you know some of these communities, it's taken them 20 years to be able to move, and I think it's it's in part that, but it's also in part that there's sort of going back to this like disrespecting sort of indigenous sovereignty and indigenous perspective um, that you know agencies have come in and be like hey we, we need to move you here and here are the steps to do that but they're really it isn't and, and I haven't participated in these conversations specifically so I, this, these are things I've heard secondhand I suppose so I just want to caveat that and it's not again I'm not trying to 
detract from the efforts that have happened and the really hard and amazing work that has happened. But I, I think there's a consistent thread here where it's entities from the outside coming to these communities and telling them what they need to do um, versus asking them to sort of lead that. Um, so I, I'd offer that. I don't, I don't have a ton of experience in this arena. Jeremy? Yeah, um, I think Aaron's Aaron's got a great point. There's a lot of, of dimensions to to that problem, and uh, you know, one of the you know, from a, a Western science perspective, we often think of this in in terms of um, the timing of, of impacts. Um, so there are you know prioritization lists of uh, of which communities are experiencing which impacts and at what rates, and to try and understand the um, the kind of the the range of, of timing by which some of the communities would be impacted in the relatively near future versus those that would be a little further down the line in terms of time. And, um, and those, those efforts proceed with, you know, engineering input and things like that. And, and so there's, there's a fair amount of capability in understanding the current threat uh, in terms of hazards and then what risks that imposes on infrastructure based on where it's built now. It doesn't do um, justice to the, you know, the potentially the risks to other aspects of, of resilience for, for communities, uh, which Aaron and, and Ray both touched on. I think the other thing uh, that that we look at is that we, we've talked around the idea of co-production, the idea of involving um, those who might use the information and, and science that get developed um, to make decisions. And uh, when you talk about something as, as important and dire as relocation, then you, you very much need the, uh, the input of, of those who are affected by it. And when you select sites um, for future um, you know, locations, uh, there's definitely the, the work that needs to go into understanding the potential impacts there as, as well. So there's a whole lot of, of things all wrapped up in there that are, are somewhat sensitive because of the, the, the nature of, of the problem. And uh, I think just from a, a Western science perspective, if we wanna address it that way, we, we can think pretty, carefully about um, the hazards that communities experience in the locations they exist now and those they might experience in the future based on future projections. But I think the, the much harder part of that is, is what does it actually mean in terms of, of community resilience? That's much dif more difficult. Okay, great, thanks. Um, we're gonna we're gonna end on time, um, but we're gonna try to fit in a couple extra questions. and. You know, ESI is DC based and our audiences, policymakers, um, Capitol Hill um, and, um, and the agencies. Um, as far as takeaways from our policymaking audience today, and Ray, this question was originally asked um, of you. So we'll start with you and then maybe we'll go to Aaron and Jeremy again. Um, what is the, in terms of takeaways, what is the most important thing for the federal government to realize about how it can interact with and support tribal adaptation planning efforts better. Um, is there a, a magic bullet or you know a, um, a shot shell of magic buckshot that you would like to see um, uh, the federal government do a little bit better on and um, support the efforts that you all are trying to undertake? Uh, let me start with the quote that Aaron's been saying for a little bit, and that is, uh, "Do I have about a month?" <laughs> um, I, 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 there's a lot to, to say of what we, what we need, and I don't know if there's one magic bullet that addresses it, but I know that one thing I can say is with the start of what tribes and organizations are doing throughout Alaska, throughout Southeast Alaska, um, is to at least to be able to give the support and the resources that's going to be needed to, uh, to address these long-term, you know, in short-term issues, if you will. Um, as we're moving forward. Um, again, with the adaptation planning, I think having an adaptation plan allows us to see down the road of what we need to plan for. And I hope that in the future, having that allows for more resources to be given to, to the state of Alaska, to tribes, to organizations that are looking to address these upcoming issues. Thanks, and Aaron, what's your perspective on that? What's, the, what's your takeaway for, for policymakers wondering how they can better support the efforts of uh, yeah, coastal resilience in Alaska? It's definitely hard to think of like sort of one thing, but I, I, I will, I, but I tried while Ray was talking. Thank you, Ray. Um, and I do think that it goes back to this point of 
actually spending the time and being willing I also to kind of give up the power, if you will, to have real conversations with these communities and asking them what they need. Um, I think it's really hard for agencies to sometimes set aside their, you know, these jurisdictions that they have that quite honestly don't fit a climate change system that's melting um, so rapidly like this one, to really set aside those mandates and those directives and figure out how they can help communities. I think that's the sort of the key. And Jeremy, what what are you hopeful to um, you know, what 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 do you advise sort of a policymaking community, whether it's a federal policymaking community or others, you know, uh, it's state regional policymaking uh, in terms of how we can better support Alaska coast Alaskan coastal resilience. Um, on that, I would I would say that um, the we in the scientific community are, are, are working toward a, a better model for how we do this kind of work. We're acknowledging that co-production of the science is a clear need and that in many cases that means um, shifting the basis for an emphasis of our scientific work to the needs of communities and members of society rather than just the intellectual curiosity that drives us to understand natural systems and the role of humans within them. And so it's a, a subtle shift in terms of vocabulary. It's a pretty radical shift in terms of um, how the members of the scientific community um, propose, conduct, and, uh, and then communicate their work. And as we transition towards that um, in, in Alaska and, and really globally, I think that um, you know, support for that shifting paradigm of how and why we do some of the science that we do. Not all of it, there's clearly a role for basic science and even applied science, but this goes beyond that. And so for, you know, for scientists to have the latitude to work with um, communities and to, to do um, more interdisciplinary work of that nature uh, is, is clearly needed. And while we're making strides in doing that from the ground up, also willingness to acknowledge the training programs that um, you know our scientists go through at the university level and in federal agencies uh, to accommodate that would be very very helpful great thanks um we're gonna sort of start wrapping it up i just want to say uh, thanks to everyone who sent in questions um most of what i asked came right from you so thank you very much for those suggestions um and actually as i was thinking we, it, we kind of did come up with a magic bullet, and that is we apparently need a month-long briefing about Alaska coastal resilience. Um, if we could only have that. Um, I don't know whether we do shifts, like, um, I don't know, we'll have to figure that out. Um, so maybe maybe that's what we'll shoot for. But this was a tremendous presentation set of presentations. Thank you to all of you. Um, I wish I could meet you in person, but thanks so much for being remote, Jeremy, Ray, and Aaron. Uh, wonderful presentations. If anyone missed any of the presentations that you heard today, uh, or if you want to revisit them, everything is available online uh, at eesi.org. I hope you'll also take a moment uh, to complete our survey. I think a slide will come up in a little while at the end of the at the end of the uh, briefing today with a survey link. Please take a moment. Um, we really do um, value all of the feedback. We want to do these even better, and so thanks everyone for taking a moment to do that. Um, you might have noticed that today's briefing looked a little different. If you came to our briefing mini series last week, it looked like a Zoom meeting. Um, this looks different, and that's because we have uh, the support of a wonderful guy named Troy. He's our videographer, uh, and he does all of our AV work and all of our briefings. You've probably seen him in the back of our in-person briefings, and he was incredibly helpful uh, bringing you this, this new format, and um, I think it looked great. I think it sounded great. Uh, and uh, um, so thanks very much to Troy. Um, thanks also to Armory, Amber, Anna, Ellen, Dan O'Brien, Uma, Sydney, everybody at ESI who helped put this on today. Um, a great briefing. Um, once again, last plug, eesi.org. Please sign up for our newsletter. And, um, you know, again, Jeremy, uh, Ray, and Aaron, thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you all take care and stay healthy. And um, I hope we'll have a chance to do a month-long briefing sometime in the near future. So thanks so much, and have a great afternoon.